All right, welcome back, coaches. We're here for our Rugby WA Coaches Series again with our high performance stream. And today we're very lucky to have Brett Igo come on board and talk to us about um, a massive area of communication, which is you know, relevant across all areas of sport and also life and, and business as well. So it's great to see we've got a few different um, industries and, and coaches and, and other areas as well joining on the chat because of such a, a diverse uh, topic like communication. So I'll bring Ando in and uh, he'll introduce Brett and we'll go from there. Thanks, Dylan, and uh, welcome uh, audience. Uh, particularly our high performance level three coaches, uh, pathway coaches, um, and obviously especially a big welcome to Brett. Um, obviously I've got a history with Brett that goes back a long way. Um, what I might do, Brett, rather than just jump yeah. straight in, I might just throw to you very quickly in a couple of minutes, just yeah. summarise your career because it's quite diverse. Um, yep. obviously you've worked across, you know, different areas of coaching. You know, I, I met you as an, a coach analyst. Yep. Um, so obviously you, you're hands on again now. Uh, so I'd like you just to give a snapshot, you know, where you're drawing your experience from, um, and, and some of the highlights too, Brett. Um, okay. If you could. Thanks mate. Yeah. Hi guys. Um, I'm, um, I'm living in, in the middle of Ireland, which is a beautiful day here. And uh, it's, uh, we're, we're in complete lockdown here. Um, it's a mad world, but look, we get an opportunity to do things like this across the world, which is, which is great. Um, I think D Dylan and Ando put up a rather flattering photograph of myself, which I've never seen before, but we, we can go from there. Um, also, I've been, I've been promoted a few, a few things too. Um, I, I'm, I'm not actually the head coach of Pathway. I'm actually the assistant and... <laughs> Um, and I haven't, I haven't completed the PhD, that, but, but I'm, I'm in the middle of doing the PhD. We're providing which, you, Brett. We're providing so, you, mate. So there's people here going, fucking hell, but there's also lads down in, up in Ireland going, Jesus, he's got about four extra jobs there. But anyway, look, <laughs> my background is, I, I originally did a sports science degree in uh, Twickenham in London and uh, returned because a family member of mine was, was ill, returned to Ireland. And I, I was actually going to stay in London because I actually enjoyed it so much. And I ended up a job working in the coach development uh, office in Leinster. And I lasted one week. Now, I wasn't sacked. There was a video, uh, video machine in the far corner, which looked as though it hadn't been used in about four or five years. Um, and the head coach at the time was a guy called Mike Ruddock, who went on and coached a Grand Slam at Wales. And he wants to know, could I use the video? And I said, yeah, I, I can. It's the same analysis equipment we were using in, in college. And I ended up being the full-time analyst for the Leinster senior team for four or five years. No other team in Ireland had an analyst at that stage. Um, it was complete madness and start of professional rugby in Ireland. So, uh, yeah, I, I was kind of in uh, right at the start. Leinster's offices was a rat-infested port of cabin. Um, so, so it became it was just a mad time but very look very enjoyable time and there was only there was only about five people employed full time and I was lucky to be one of them so I kind of I was involved right at the at the very start of 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 Leinster rugby and, and Irish rugby when it comes to analysis for certain and um, then I was lucky enough uh, Maddie Williams came in and took over and then I went to uh, he brought me to Scotland which was look for for someone young to get a job working in a national team is just brilliant uh, really, really enjoyed it. Uh, however, as as Ando probably said, I think we did, I think we did nineteen matches, seventeen, nineteen matches, and you have in two years, eh? Yeah, so it was about World two years. Cup. World Cup in two thousand and three. Uh, look, you, you get to work with people like Jim Telfer and Ian McGeek, and who were obviously legends of the game in Scotland, uh, which was which is a great experience to say you worked with those guys before they they more or less finished up. Um, yeah, no, look, it was huge learnings. 99.9% uh, .9 were really, really good, good crack, good fun. Uh, you're just working at that level. It's just incredible. Um, and then we all got sacked on, on one day. So um, we, we were left unemployed and returned to Ireland. Ended up getting a job as a lecturer um, in, in rugby studies, which, was, which is a, a Leinster-funded and Institute of Technology-funded job in Carlow. 
And then I set up a, a master's in the Institute of Technology in sports performance analysis. And we've been going at that for, I think, six, seven years now. So we basically train, it's the only master's in sports performance analysis in Ireland. Um, so we end up training all the professional analysts through our GA sports and our um, the national soccer team, obviously rugby teams, um, the GA teams, all, all those sort of basketball, hockey. So we have a, we have a good cohort. It's, it's busy. We only have 12, 15 students on any one year. Um, most of them are part-time. They work in industry. It's really good because they can, they can do one day a week and they can keep their jobs going for the other six days. Um, so that, that's been quite enjoyable. And I also did the analysis for the age grade teams in Leinster and the national under 18s, under 19s teams for the IRFU. And now I've moved into coaching, which is, which is great fun, really enjoyable coaching the pathway within Leinster, uh, which is the, the famous Leinster production line, which you've just seen these kids come up at 16, 17 years of age. And you look at the national team now and, and they're all there. And the, the James Ryans, the, the, the Porters, the Lemores, like they've all come through that particular team. Um, I think someone told me that they, that team produces more professional rugby players than, um, than most other age grade teams in the world. So, so it's, it's a pretty exciting time. Um, I don't know where these kids are going to get rugby in the future because the production line is just so good. It's, it's a fantastic production line. Um, so look, to be, to be involved in that is brilliant. Um, I'm in the middle of, of doing a PhD at the moment, which is, which is in performance. Um, so that's probably keeping me busy too. And I also coach University College Dublin in the All-Ireland League, which is, our, which is your first grade rugby. That team, we have probably 20 plus professional rugby players who are all with Leinster, contracted players in Leinster. We obviously don't see these players um, because they're with Leinster. However, if players, like, if players need game time, they get dropped down. So at the, I think we probably had about 10 professionals this year who drop in and out, which is, which is an interesting one to manage to see how, how you go about that. But it's, look, it's good fun. The, the standard is just incredible. And, and just working with those players, and you learn a lot from them because they are coming from a very professional environment. They're, they're with the number one team in Europe. And you just pick it. You, you pick their brains all the time. And, and that's where we as coaches, the, the the good coaches are magpies and we're, we're not filing cabinets. So I, I think we, we've got a, we're really good at picking those off. And I love when they come training because you just pick so much information off them. It's incredible. So that's it, Ando, in a, in a, oh, in a two minute chat. Yeah, I noticed you brushed over your time at Scotland pretty quickly. Uh, um, <laughs> no, I, I do. Have, I do have the scars. I, I may add. I may add to the audience that I had nothing to do with Brett sacking, even though I was a high performance <laughs> manager. I survived. <laughs> but uh, yeah, yeah I, tough, I, I always tough wondered that. <laughs> tough period. Uh, yeah. No. See, look. It, it was Ando. It was a tough period. Like, but someone asked me there a few months ago whether did you think going to Scotland tampered your career in the long term. And yeah, it probably did. Without doubt it did. However, I think long, long term, I don't think it did because I think the learnings that you get from an experience like that uh, and the scars you have, I think you've got to take them and, and, and move them on. And I probably learned more about myself and more about people and more about coaching setups and, and teams and how t team dynamic, player dynamic than, than anything else. And I don't think you can get that experience anywhere else. And I know we're, we're on a, on a coaching webinar and we, we all do our coaching courses, but, but there's, no, uh, there's no page in the coaching manual to, to deal with what, what you deal with in an environment like that. And yeah, you've got to right. learn by doing. Like. You're dead right, Brett. And um, it, it's a good segue in, and I'll pose the question and it's, it's, a, it's a comparative question. So and obviously the centre of our discussions around communication. Um, so if you had to look at... Um, uh, Leinster is an example that went on and won, yep. you know, the Magnus League and, you know, very successful in that era when you, before you went to Scotland. Yeah. So we go for, you go from Leinster, you know, one of the, the, the most successful provincial teams in Europe. Then you come over to the Scottish national team. Yeah. Complete contrast. Um, I mean, if we talk communication, 
uh, there, there's specific areas from those, those experiences that you can compare uh, of what you should do and what you shouldn't do. Yeah, look, I think that's a really good question because it's probably one that, that you look back and go, well, why, why did we fail there? Or what did we do? What was our learnings there? And I think the era that Willie Anderson, who was the assistant coach, Maddie, who was the head coach, and myself, we're leaving one of the top teams in Europe. And, with, uh, and we can ream off those players who are all, they're not even, they're, they're not only Irish rugby stars, they're actually world rugby stars. Yeah. So the likes of Gordon Darcy and Brian O'Driscoll and Malcolm O'Kelly and people like that who are all British lines, you're leaving them and you're going into an environment that was a few years back when it comes to professionalism. Um, the, the, I, I don't mean that in any disrespectful way of the people that were involved or anything, but, but that's the situation they were in. The, the Leinster team were a lot further down the road in terms of different things like their, their recovery, match preparations, um, whether it be having full-time analysts. But there were so many different areas and they were more professional than that national team at, this, at, at that stage. And that, yeah, yeah. that's just where we were and that's just, that was the situation you were in. My learning from it was we took a plan that was very successful for our club side and brought the exact same plan into a national team. However, we didn't have the same players. And don't get me wrong, I'm not, I'm not a portion and blame to players by any stretch of the imagination. That was, the, that was a management mistake. Mm. That, that we brought a successful plan and we're probably scratching our heads going, well, why isn't it not successful here? You know, and and that, that's probably one of the biggest learnings. And it's learnings for me to take in different coaching roles that I've had. That, that just because the plan worked in one organization, doesn't mean it's going to work for the next organization or even the next team. So I'm looking, we, we had a huge successful season in UCD this year and we could very easily go and copy that plan and produce it and go again and get relegated, you know, yeah. and, but so we've got to evolve and it's probably a huge lesson uh, for me about you've got to evolve as a coach. You've got to keep learning as a coach, you know, and, and learn from those, get those scars and, and, and learn from them and look, look back at them. Um, I, was, I was on a webinar the other day who were, they were talking about uh, reviewing performance and the amount of coaches I've worked with where you, you've lost the game and just, they just close the laptop and go, no, I'm not looking at that again. Whereas I think you've got to look at it. You've got to look at the, the things. And there were some really good things we did in Scotland, but there was, there was some bad things too, you know. So if, if you just focus on communication, Brett, yep. like w were there specific areas inside the community? Because communication manifests in a whole host of different uh, ways between player, coach, um, you know, coach to executive level, um, you know, even down to on the game day with, with um, you know, interpretation of messages. Um, yep. you, it was interesting you, you compared, you know, the cattle the players yep. that weren't at your disposal. Was there a, a moment, like, and as you know, I was, I was involved in yep. that as well as, and I did it, I was a defence coach, so I understand where you're coming from, but I want you to isolate and think back. Were there particular light bulb moments where you went, hello, we're in trouble here, and it's from a communication angle? Yeah. Um, so we brought the Irish system. So the way that Irish rugby works is, there's four provincial teams that feed into a national team and it's run by the people who run the national team. So it's basically four, four to five separate businesses that, that filter up into it. The number one goal for, uh, and the communication from the IRFU was the, the national team is number one. So Maddie wanted that similar, similar uh, program within Scotland so that the national team became number one. Um, and this is where the communication comes into it. That. I don't think that was explained well to the three pro pr franchises. And, and I'm going to take my, because I was a performance analyst, I was looking at it. I was coming from a system where everyone fed into the national team. So, so the Munster analyst and the Leinster analyst, who was me at the time, we all fed in the information, whether it be tapes and codes, codes and, and all that sort of information on players, we fed into central centrally. Whereas, there was a complete and utter breakdown. And this is where I knew we were in a bit of trouble because we wanted the same, but I didn't, the same processes, but we didn't communicate what the reasons were. 
and we really struggled. And I and I don't know whether it was uh, uh, you're all foreigners and you're telling us what to do, but but I didn't. I actually think we should have all got in a room and just had a few beers and said, listen, what, what's beneficial for the national team isn't going to benefit the Edinburgh's, Glasgow's and Borders at the time. But we, we didn't do that. It was it was a case of this is what we're doing. And it was more dictatorial than anything else. And it wasn't, it definitely wasn't shared, uh, shared ideas. Um, and there was a breakdown in communication. It, it was simple as. Okay. So, so we're putting like, Edinburgh were doing their own thing. Glasgow were doing yeah. their own thing. We tried to, we tried to link everything together, and, the, and it was the same. The, the fitness staff were the exact same, yeah. and everyone was working in silos, and nothing connected. And that that break that that failure from us to communicate that information of what what the plan was. So it, it wasn't actually Edinburgh's fault. It was actually our fault, you know. And and there was. That's right. There was, um, yeah, it was just a complete breakdown in, in, in talk. And, and, and that's the thing. Where like, when I go through the presentation, you, you're going to see that. You're going to see that happening. Okay. Um, and it's, how do we as coaches deal with that? You the, know, lack how, of buy-in. We... the lack of, lack of buy-in too, Brett. Like, I mean, yeah. I, I, I know we tried on, you know, just staying on point with this discussion. Uh, with the communication process, we, we did try to communicate with um, the provincial head coaches. Yeah. But they were very staid, um, didn't, weren't, weren't accepting to change. They weren't accepting to, you know, there was a battle between the provincial flag and the national flag. Um, yeah. So all, all those particular areas were working against, you know. But, but Ando, I don't think we ever, we ever talked, uh, and communication has to be both ways, you know, and I think we want to say we'll go with the analysis of we want this analysis done this way and we fed into the national team and that's that's the way it was and that's the way we want to do yeah but there was no actual conversation back to ask them what would you like here yeah how how do you see this benefiting you and 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 this is where communication in in high performance teams fails is when we when it becomes this one-way messaging and and it doesn't loop but by asking by asking the, the the Edinburghs of the world, what do you want here? It probably would yeah. have saved. It probably might have got us an extra year. Without you know, doubt. Like, Without you doubt. know, by having that relationship, and and that to me is real key. However, it's only only ten years down the line that I've learned this. You know, and, yeah. and it's it's a look back. You know, and and we can think of all areas of our communications and. I have a I coached in a in a private boarding school for for ten years in Ireland, and the parents were the ones that were that were really really tough. And I look back now and I go, do you know what I should have done? I should have had a meeting at this very start of the year, and I should have laid everything on the table and said, this is what we're going to do. We got to think as coaches when it comes to te- things like selection. We don't select teams to lose games; we select to win games. And I don't think that communication message really gets out there. I don't. I don't say I'm not picking him at nine this week because I want to lose the game. I'm picking that guy at nine because I do want to win the game. You know, and I don't think we get that. That that's just a breakdown in, in our communication skills. Yeah, yeah, you know, of course it is. And and look, that's there's a, plenty. Look, there's plenty of examples of it. Yeah, yeah. Um, look, just a, I'll just go into a, a little general discussion. As I mentioned to you in our preparation for tonight. Um, just a it was a you know a moment in your you, you mentioned you've only just started to learn about the benefit of say you know communication and is it was there a moment like a light bulb moment Brett where you went God th- this is a particular area uh, as in communication that that really has a major impact on performance yeah. Um... Uh, yeah, I got this. Uh, I got a gig coaching in University College Dublin, which it, it was actually a job I really wanted for for probably about five or six years now, because of the talent that they had. Um, like you've got half your team are, are are professional players. The other the other half are players who nearly made it, and with a bit of luck, they probably would have made it. So they're all guys who played Ireland 18s, 19s, all the way up, but they weren't good enough to to push in into a senior t- senior Leinster contract and stuff. So I knew that the talent was there. So it was a gig I really wanted. So one thing I, re- I really wanted to connect with the players 
So I set up a player's WhatsApp group and I threw up and said, uh, anyone want to sit down and have a chat before training, let me know. I waited two weeks. I got nothing. Absolutely nothing. Players never interacted. There was no messages on the, on the, on the WhatsApp group. And I was going, Phew, this is going to be a tough gig. Like they, the players don't really want to have a chat. And I'm all about having chats and I'm all about sitting there ha- talking to the players. What do you think of this? What do you think of that? I'm all into sending video clips. What do you think? And, and trying to engage with them. And I, I kind of was a bit baffled. Um, so I text one of the senior players and I said, listen, um, you meet me for training for a coffee. Um, so I met him for a coffee. We had a chat and everything was good. And I, and I had the laptop with me and I pulled out two clips and I showed him two clips from the weekend's games. And I said, um, listen, what do you think? And all of a sudden, it, it, it snowballed. It absolutely snowballed because they saw you as hold on a minute, he's meeting these players to actually help them by actually opening up a line of communication. These, I'm now becoming a better player by, by watching clips, by having a chat with the coach. Now, these are all university students. They could have been just in it for the free coffee and the free muffin before training. I, I don't know. Maybe, maybe that's what it was. But we've now developed a culture where you now get a text message on the Tuesday saying, Brett, are you free? Uh, I can meet you at five. Now, it makes my day a bit longer that training starts at seven and you're there at five and you're doing more or less um, four or five chats with players, video one-on-one sessions. But unbeknown that that was my aim, by the way, it actually just happens and it's evolved to a really good link between coach and players. And it's something that has accidentally happened. And I, I find that some of the best things you do as a coach are things that you didn't actually plan for, but they've just yeah. evolved into this. And it's a it's created a really strong link so you know i you now get text messages from the players how are you going during lockdown how are the kids because it wasn't just about rugby it was about them so what are you studying how's your exams going uh but it became very much a two-way thing um and i just think it's been it was a light bulb moment for me when it comes to players um that's they're they're the ones on the pitch and you've got to have that strong link between the two between the two sets between the players and the coach and that that to me was my biggest light light bulb moment definitely in the last two years yeah it's a, it's sometimes as you said it's a, it's the simplicity of it as well Brett. it wasn't complicated yeah. it was just having a chat very informal uh, yeah you know, it would uh, uh, be interesting to see what they what did they think when the first, when the when the messages first went out, like what was their, what was their yeah. thinking if they, they didn't really want to engage in the coach? Now, some of them might have been coming from a background where the coach was king and the players didn't really have too much of a say. You know, whereas yeah. for, for me, I'm coaching some of the best players in the country outside the professional game. There's like, you got to respect that. You've got to have a yeah. huge, huge amount of respect for it. But that, that communication moment just really, really kickstarts I actually think it's kicked start a really successful season. Mm. Yeah. It's um I know you're gonna talk about a lot of this around the relationship, which I think is, you know, the, the central point between a coach and a player in terms of you know, the relationship has so many dynamics. Um yep. and obviously communication is key to building that relationship. So we're we're all very interested in to hear around some of those experiences through the session, Brett. Yep. Yep. Um, so, mate, look, I'll hand it over to you now. Um, okay. And we'll get on with the presentation. And, and Dil, did you want to talk to him about, I know you mentioned the WhatsApp control uh, messages. Did you want them through the session? Yeah, yeah. So if they've still got anything they want to add, they just use the chat line and I'll bring them through. But otherwise, um, we can leave questions for the end. But, Brett, you should be able to now share your screen. Yeah. Can you see that now? Um, here, I'll stop my share. Okay. I should have Brett's now. Okay. Is that up on the screen, Ando? Yeah, mate. Okay. Um, I'm not going to go through that because we've, we've, we've been through that one already uh, with Ando. Um, yeah. Look, Ando asked me to do this uh, um, talk on communication. And, and I have a coach education background. And the first port of call for myself was I went to the books. And I pulled these out or sitting up, sitting, 
gathering dust, I must say, um, in the back of the shelf from the bookshelves. We all have fancy bookshelves now with, with, with Zoom. Um, the amount of calls I'm on with everyone with their bookshelves in the background is, is quite phenomenal. But anyway, so I, I went to these books and I, and I opened them up and there's some really good ones there. And I went to the back and checked it out and I found that every one of those books had next to nothing on communication. And that was the only one on the right hand side where it actually says um, communication, one page, page 226. And it was a bit of a wow moment, actually. Now, the wow was probably panic that I had to do a presentation on communication and I was missing my, my clutch that I needed to, to, to help me with it. Because being, a, being an academic, that's probably what you do first. However, when you go through the front of these books, whereas that's the back of the book, you actually find out that every single chapter is about communication. Mm. And, and that's what coaching is. And it is definitely one of the bedrocks for all of us. And the really good coaches I've worked with, their, their, their communication skills right throughout their whole, the whole avenue of being a coach has been absolutely touch, top notch. And if I actually think, who are the good coaches that you work with? What did they have over everyone else? And communication is absolutely massive. We have a coach in Leinster, Stuart Lancaster, who's a former England head coach. His communication skills are incredible. They're absolutely incredible. Um, I've watched him on the field coaching a number of times. He does a lot of age grades, um, schools, clubs, coaches. Um, they'll mic him up. They'll put him on the, on the field. Uh, we've actually done a, a, a coach behavior study on him within the IT amongst uh, master students. And his communication skills are absolutely excellent. Um, so, I just, just, wanted... just stay on point there, Brett. Yeah. Like, um, with regards to Stuart, I know we've had lengthy yeah. discussions about it, but just for the audience, you know, what, what, what defines uh, Stuart's communication skill? His ability to get on the field, his ability to, to get his message from what is going on in his head whether it be tactical or technical, to the players, um, it's very clear. It's very direct. Um, one thing he does when we did the coach behavior study is uh, his use of name. And it's a verbal use of name. So you know exactly who he's talking, talking to, and whether, it be, whether it be a nickname or first name. Um, and straight away, when you hear your name on the field, and I'm only putting my, 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 my mind in the players, it is completely directed to you. So he might have 50 blokes on a training field. And because he uses the name, it, your ears prick up. Go, well, okay, okay he's talking to me. He's, he's given me my, a time here where he's, he's spotted something in my game that I did well or something I didn't do well. And that, that to me is a huge... Uh, it's a huge area of communication and coach behavior um, but by making it personal and making it that, that it's the messages for you. Um, he has a fantastic mind, uh, tactical mind of the game, and he's able to articulate it in a very simple way. Um, like we all know as coaches, you're sitting there, whether it be attack and defense, just complexities within our game. But his terminology around those complexities make it really, really simple to understand. And I think we went through a bit of a, a bit of time in Irish rugby, definitely in around the 2000 mark, 20 years ago, where we had a name for everything. You know, the, the, the Australian coaching influence, we had a name for absolutely every, every step into a tackle, every moment in a tackle, every time we cleared a rook, everyone had a name. Whereas this That's is just simple. It's just simple messaging. And, and when you watch them, it's, I just love going to watch you. I, I, go, I like going to watch good coaches do it. Yeah. And, and, and that's what he does. You know, I don't have privilege into sitting in team meetings. I don't know what they look like. I, I, I don't know what um, um, any of, of those off field looks like. Uh, his, his podcasts that he does, his, his, he's, he's delivered for age grade coaches in Leinster very recently. Um, yeah, it was, it was excellent. Really, really good. One of the most enjoyable podcasts I had because of the, his manner of communication was excellent. Thanks, Mike. Um, I just want to show this, uh, which I don't know whether 
this guy speaking Scottish, so Australian people might not understand him, but we'll, we'll give it a go. So this is a guy, Alex Ferguson, who's one of the top coaches in the world. Let play of, of the job that you've done. And you say that the two most powerful words that you can ever use are well done. How liberally did you throw those around? Or did you say them for special training ground all the time? Never criticise players in the training ground. Always uh, support the view of saying well done and encourage them in the training session all the time, well done. But the, the, on the recognition and communication, this is a valuable lesson for anyone. Um, at Harvard, one of the students asked me a question. What would you like to have known 30 years ago that you know now? I was deaf with communication. But as a young manager, this is among 32 years of age, I went to rule the world. I was buying grass seats, ordering pies, programs, the lot. And what happens is that you neglect the guy who can sack you as the manager, the, the chairman. And we never spoke, you know. And no matter what you think of your chief executive, of your chairman, you've got to find a way of communicating with them. The other part, aspect of communication is recognition of staff. Recognise the people who work for you. Always say good morning. Get to know them. And at United and the Carrington, the groundsmen, the, the girls in the laundry, and the, the, the girls in the tea room and the cafe and the, the administration, all part of it. You know, for instance, you think about it, there's a couple of girls in the, uh, in, in the grew up to come in at 16. One was married with kids now, you know what I mean? You see them growing up, you know? Uh, but always recognise them as really important because you build a fort around you. And when things are going wrong, you know that everyone at Carrington is behind me. You know, there is great support from them. And, you know, a fantastic. I miss that. I miss that. I miss that. I miss that. I, miss that. I went in one day and um, Kathy Phipps, you know, Kathy at the reception, she says, hey, Denise and Wanda wants to see you. I says, what's your one? He said, I don't know. So it goes along. She says, where's my effing money? <laughs> And they paid her for six weeks for the lottery. <laughs> the, the essence of that message was there was no way she would speak to me that way unless there was a great communication between us, you know? Yeah. That was an important message. That. I don't. Communication. So. Look, the reason why I put that, that particular clip up, um, there was just two aspects to it. And there, there are two that really, really hit home with me um, because of, of experience. And it's something that I've probably taken from my Scottish experience more than anything else. Um, his, the first one was, um, or sorry, the second one was about um, building a fortress around him and that relationship with his staff. And I don't know whether Ando would, would agree or disagree with me, but it was something that I think is badly, badly needed. Um, it, when, our, when we went to Scotland and I didn't think we had it, I think we had a very uh, fortified uh, staff that were, we were brought in, but the staff that were already there probably weren't part of that. And yeah. Yeah, part of that was, was... Sorry, Ando. Yeah, you're right, mate. There was a... I mean, I'd, I'd already been there you know, probably two or three seasons before you guys got there. And there was already a them and us before you got there, Brett. So, yeah. you know, the staffing model, which is so important to be integrated, uh, it just didn't happen. Um, but it, that was a problem before we got, you guys got there. Um, yeah. So it was an ongoing issue, but certainly that, I, th I think little things too symbolically, Brett, just now that you mentioned it again, like, you know, um, if you can remember, we had a room called the War Room. That's right. Yeah. You know, even that it had a it had a label, it had a title, and it was out of bounds, so to yeah. speak. And it was in the main office, the main building yeah. at Murrayfield. So yeah. I, I think they're the, you know sort of diversionary. They they they're actually um, hurdles. They're symbolically yeah. they're hurdles to to the yeah. to the, the whole of but, but because of that poor community we didn't really communicate what right. that was and how important that was. Uh, and we definitely didn't have a, a, a connected culture of that everyone within this organization 
is for the success of the Scottish rugby team. And I think that's, that's really but important I'm... for, for anyone who's coaching out there that is everyone in your club or your school or, or your, um, uh, your team that you're working with is everyone in the organization push, pushing for that win on the weekend. And I think if you can start creating that true, very strong communication, because they have to understand what you're about, why you're trying to do this, because if there is a breakdown, you, you create a them and us straight away. Yes. And I thought Alec Ferguson just summed it up really, really well. And, and I don't know whether he, he's probably not a coach that you guys see down the Southern Hemisphere too much, is he? Soccer. And, but he, he's probably one of the... He, he's a he's very got, successful coach yeah, up here. He's then. globally recognised. Um, yeah. Obviously held yeah. in high esteem down here. But uh, there's two things that I got out of that too. Brett was yeah. uh, sort of tailors into, uh, I suppose, the coach and what, what his role is with communication is, you know, the encouragement side of things. Simplicity in itself. Yeah. Encouraging or encouragement used inside the training environment. I yeah. suppose the... There's always the overuse, and he was asked about that, but he was quite liberal with it by the sounds of it. And the other one was the recognition of staff, which you mentioned. Yes. Yeah. Um, so they're, they're incredibly important points for all levels of coaching. Um, yeah. It doesn't matter what environment you're in, uh, they're, they're incredibly important. The other one, the other one again, that we, we've got to have really good communication around is the people that hire us and the people that, that fire us. And the people who run our organization, whether they be chairmen or our CEOs, and depending on what level we work with. And that is really, really important for us to be very clear in our communication. Um, and what information are we, are we communicating with this person? Does this pe person know what you're about? Um, do you know anything about them? Do you know anything about their business? Um, what information do you know about them? So for example, I've worked with coaches who used to flap their arms up and down. They, they, they needed either equipment and the chairman wasn't giving them the money for the equipment. Now, it probably wasn't put to the chairman why they needed this essential equipment. But what might not have, have come back to the coach was the fin there were, might have been financial constraints that, that wasn't allowing that, that, that to happen. You know, so by, by gaining the information of the person that's running the club and running the team, and by you, by having a, that, that clear two-way conversation, you get to understand of being in their shoes. Yeah. And, and I think that's, that's really, really important. We were, our Scottish days, they were 30, 40 million in debt. They were, they were in all sorts of financial problems. But the national team still wanted X, Y, and Z. And we probably didn't really understand what 30 million of debt really was or whatever, whatever the figure was. At the time, but I know it was quite 20, substantial. 20, 26 million pound. Okay. So uh, that's. So, but just one question on, yeah. you, know, you know, it's a general question, but it's certainly specific to every environment. Yeah. Um, where does success and failure implicate or compromise, you know, the effectiveness of uh, communication? Yeah, look, success will cover a multitude of problems, we'll cover them up. Um, so you're winning, everyone's happy, everyone's clear, everyone's clapping each other on the back, everything's brilliant. Um, you're, uh, for example, you've just dropped a player, you haven't communicated that information with the player, and on Saturday night you've won the game, you're kind of going, eh, there you go, I won the game. Ah, ha, ha. Whereas it, it, it doesn't point to you, uh, to your mess up of how you actually approach that player. And, and what did that communication look like? You lose the game, all of a sudden there's a new can of worms open for you because yeah. everything gets highlighted beyond belief and, and exaggerated. You know, I, 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 I'm actually glad I, I didn't work in Scotland during social media, because, which is another brand of communication, um, which, which is, is, can be quite vile at times. Um, but I don't know how we would have survived losing all those games with 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 social media. The mental, the, the mental uh, ability of the coach might have been completely shot at that stage. But I just I just think that we winning and losing just it, it's two opposite ends of the spectrum, and okay. we cover all the badness when you win. 
and the high and the badness gets highlighted when you lose. You well, know, it becomes probably, exaggerated. You're, you're probably more prone uh, to being, I suppose, exposed when you're losing. You know, your system yeah. becomes under under threat. Uh, as distinct from say when you're winning, no yeah. one really cares because you're getting the, the W every week. No one yeah. cares. Um, yeah. So there's an assumption there as well, Brett, that everything's hunky dory. Yeah. Um, and as you know, there's a lot of successful teams in all professional sports or all levels really that, that can function quite well year from one year uh, and not change too much the following year, have the same playing yeah. staff, have the same coaching staff, and then they bottom out. Yeah. You know, because they haven't they haven't done their homework around the communication side of it all. Um, so you're right, masking's a, an issue, and that's that's why I was uh, interested to hear your difference between a, a winning environment and a losing environment, and where yeah. does communication become compromised? Yeah. Um, I'm going to go through who do we communicate with as as coaches, because it might, it might spark a few a few interesting uh, points. Obviously, the players, it becomes hugely important to get that link with them. We communicate through coaching. And then there's like a jigsaw puzzle of, of who we communicate with, which we don't actually, we probably don't sit down and think about enough, um, whether it be mental values, culture, leadership, game models. Uh, then there's all the staff. And depending on how high in the ladder that you go, if you're a normal club coach, it might just be you and your assistant. And you might have a doc on the sideline or a physio on the sideline. Uh, the higher level that you go, you might be into your S and C coaches, your performance analysts, um, all that sort of information. I, I'll give you one on 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 say physios. Um, I think physios are a fantastic uh, relationship to have with a head coach. I I, I really believe that because the players, the players are are, are fantastic at, at at giving out the information to the to the physios and if you can get a really strong relationship with the physio you might gain a lot about what the team and what the what the vibe of the team is currently um different different areas like players who are injured players who aren't injured i've had tons and tons of players tell me they're 100 percent fit ready for the game and 10 minutes into the game they look and go i have to come off then you have that conversation with the player afterwards and you find out that he actually wasn't right all the time but because of poor relationship and poor uh, communication between player and coach we haven't actually we didn't actually know that and because of poor relationship with physio or poor communication with physio and not having an adequate communication system that has actually happened and i think we all as coaches have come into situations like that with players through playing through injury players who aren't fit players who are fit and that is a really powerful it's a powerful communic. The physio to me communicates with the team, and, and they're kind of like the heartbeat of the team, and probably have been for a hell of a lot of professional teams. They are, they are they are an important link. So so that that's one that's definitely going to have to. I would recommend that you 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 get that strong relationship. Obviously, assistant coaches is massive. If if there are assistants that you've brought in and you have a working relationship with. Yeah, you, they, they understand how you work. If they're brand new and you've never worked with these people before, that chain of communication has, has, has got to start. You, you've got to link in. You've got to, you, you, you've got to be connected. You know, because if you have no understanding about what they're doing on the field, that, that's, we're at nothing really as coaches. Freddie, you don't mind. Um, Dill, can you take Tony Ayub's mic off there? Off mute. You're still there, Tony? I certainly am. And so really can I, can, fantastic. Can I just bring you in on this, uh, Tony? Look, for those in the audience, Tony's, um, what do you got, Tony? 25 plus years at a professional level as a physio, head of performance at the moment at Canterbury Bankstown in the NRL. Yep. Um, Australian Kangaroos physio, goes back two decades, Tony. Uh, yeah, I did it for 18 years. Yeah, so obviously I've worked with Tony at the Melbourne Storm as well. So, Tony, I wouldn't mind getting your views because that's an incredibly important point that Brett brought up around the physio area. Obviously, you're, you're across, you know, performance area per se, but you're a physiotherapist, obviously. So, did you want to just chat a little bit about that, Tony? 
Oh, look, I, I, I totally agree with Brett. I, I think he's hit the nail on the head. And, you know, in my role at the moment as a as a high performance, you know, manager of all the staff, the S&Cs and the, and the medical staff um, at Canterbury, like I, I, I go to the physios a hell of a lot because in my role as a head physio for, you know, 25 of those 30 years, is you get a real good feel for, for you know, where the group's at. Um, they tend to open up a lot more because you're, you're one-on-one with them. I, I actually, you know, and I've said it to, to my two young physios that we've got at our club is, you know, they've got the hardest job in the in the, in the um, organisation simply because of the man hours they have to put in. And because of those man hours, they spend so much time with the players and get to know the players really well. Um, so I, I actually use them a hell of a lot with, you know, where the group's at, how they're feeling, is there any whinging going on with, you know, how we're um, structuring their, their um, strength and conditioning. Um, so, yeah, I, I totally agree with Brett. I, I think it's really yeah. important. So Tony, do you do you actually even though you're mentoring, you're you're actually mentoring a lot of people now, but and and have done previously, obviously. But um, do you enable that process between the physio, as a, as an example, and the head coach? How do you how do you manage that process? Do they have to come back to you with information, or do you try and coach uh, those physios, those S and C guys? No, I, 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 what. I see my role, um, Ando, as um, I, I try and be really inclusive. Um, you know, like it's, you know, the head coach comes to me a hell of a lot, but when we're in meetings and we're talking about, you know, our areas, I, I like the strength guy to speak when when we're talking about strength. I like the conditioner to speak when we're talking about conditioning, and I certainly put the physios front and centre when we're talking about injuries. I let them, although we discuss it every day, and I'm I'm over the top of it, and I probably. You know, just from my years of experience, I lead them down a certain path. I try and give them a fair bit of autonomy and, and let them make the decisions and then communicate that to me first. And if I'm happy with it, then, yeah, I, I make them communicate that with the coaches because, again, I'm not going to be around forever. So I see it my role as one where, you know, I've, I've got to bring the staff and I've got to challenge the staff and bring them, bring them on because, you know, my time's coming and going and, and it's important from my perspective, that I leave the, the place in a better position and someone can step up to a role when I'm gone. Yeah, of course, yeah. Thank, thanks for that feedback, Tone. Uh, good point, Brady. Yeah, um, Keep going, Tony, Brady. I, I think you're, you're spot on, but I think, I think that relationship that the physio has got to be confident enough that, that you're not going to betray them in any sort of way, that, that you can't... They're they're not used as the snitch of the team. They're they're, yeah. they're not telling stories out of school. That but they're everything is for the benefit of the team. And I think the really good physios know that, and the really good coaches know that. And it's just get about getting that bond and that and getting the information without harming the the team dynamic as well. Yeah, I, I totally agree with you. And 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 that's the challenge that I've got at the moment is I've got two young physios who are you know just feeling their way. They're they're you know, a little bit last year was, you know, like the deer in the headlights, um, you know, just loving life and, um, you know, being involved with the players at that, that high level. But, again, yeah, trying to get through to them, that it, 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 it's really important that you all have the same messaging with the players. Because quite often, and, and I'm, I'm, a, I'm a hard taskmaster, Brett, so, you know, I've been around long enough like Ando and yourself where you know when a player's being soft and when a player's not. Yeah. And that's the, yeah. that's the challenge for me is to get through to our, our younger staff who haven't got the experience um, we've got to have that same messaging. And I found it really difficult last year with two really young physios where, um, you know, they were, they were siding with the player more often than not and it took me longer to get them back to where we wanted to be. But we've, we sorted that out through the, that latter end of the season and, and um, through, the, through the pre-season. And, and you know, I've just got full confidence in them now. So, but you're, you're exactly right about the snitch part of it. They don't want to... I want to betray that, at, and I and I find myself in tough situations because quite often, and and this is, you know, Ando knows me well. I, I, you know, if there's a problem that I thought I could solve, I'd solve it. If it was it was something outside of footy, um, with the players in in all my years doing that role. But if there was something higher than me, you know, I made sure I, I, I took it to the coach or took it to our footy manager and stuff like yeah, that. Of course, it's a, it's a real balance. But you, you yeah. you're 100 right, and. You know, the communication factor, whether you're a head coach or a high performance manager or whatever, oh, it's, 
it's just so important. It's amazing how many do get it wrong. Yeah. Oh. Yeah, no, definitely. Yeah. Um, moving on, obviously, Alec, Alec Ferguson spoke about the administration and the chairman and CEO. That's important for, for us. They're, they're people that we, we communicate with. Selection, non-selection um, becomes a, an interesting one for coaches. How, how do we go about that in terms of communication? Dropping down the level, depending on how high you look, you're, you're up as academy and talent ID. And obviously, we're communicating game strategy, media, depending on where, where you sit on the ladder, how you communicate with them. So, so you see, it, it just keeps going on and on. Parents, if, you're, if we're at age grades, how are we communicating with the parents? Uh, because they're, they're, they're an important link. We've got to understand that the, these are the people that are driving your, your, your players to training. So, so we, we've got to give them the information because most of these people are they're working. They might have other kids. So, so that's a whole... Like we could probably exhaust about two hours just on that particular topic. Um, contracts, agents, um, coach education department, um, game day, referees becomes a, an interesting one as well. So, so you can see there, there's just a massive, massive amount of communication you as the head coach or you as, as a leading coach have got to have. So if, if these are all the areas that you can influence and sometimes you can control, um, you've got to be pretty good at this. Now, the one I'm going to concentrate on, I'm just going to take one of them, which is going to be game day, about what our communication is like for game day. But I could circle any one of them and exhaust two hours of a presentation. Nice. Um, and, that, and that was the challenge when Ando asks, asks me to present on communication. This is what I wrote down. Who do we communicate with and, and which one will I deliver on? But, because I could have delivered on anything, you know, and... and and that's there are issues that we currently have for as coaches, you know. Yeah, it's, uh, it's a um, that that slide, Brett, is yep. a re, is a dead set reality. That's what you're confronted uh, and, with. And, and there's a, people here that that are probably screaming at the screen that I forgot some. I've probably forgotten about another twenty yeah, things. Yeah, uh, definitely. I mean, it's hugely important that we understand the scope of our role as a coach. Um, you know, like in terms of communication and where the linkages are. And obviously, wherever yeah. there's a linkage, there's the potential for fail. Yeah. So that's, that's why the contingency planning, the, the openness, the transparency, the engagement, um, you know, all catchphrases and catchwords, but so incredibly important if you define their meaning and put yeah. them into context. So that, that's a fantastic slide. Okay. Um, okay, so game day, uh, again, the academic in me, and again, I've, I've moved from being practical to academic and back to practical again, again so I, I kind of bounced between two. So the academic in me went and had a look at the research to see, well, what did that do? There is absolutely more or less nothing on, on communication. I did find one, which is a French study, even though uh, Stephen Harvey and Richard Light work in, in university in Lutbury University in London, or in, in just outside of Leicester. So a study of in-game coaches' communications. And they did it on French coaches. And they did it on the French national team under-21s, the, the women's national team, and then a, a team of amateurs. And this is what... So you have their names going across the top of what the coaches were. And then on the left-hand side, you can see uh, the number of times they had in interventions and then the types of communication. So this is, these are real studies. So this is what it's telling us. So this particular under 21 coach uh, at 46 times when the ball is in play, he communicated or he had an intervention. He shouted something at a player. Now we've got to put ourselves in the player's shoes here. What do you think when all of us were playing and we had our mad coach on the sideline and he starts shouting something at you as the ball's in play, like you're in defense and you're trying to concentrate on where's the ball? Who am I, who am I covering here? What channel am I covering? What's my line speed here? Like, there's so much information going on in my head as a player. And all of a sudden, guys on the si sidelines shouting, you've got to mark him. You've got to do this. You've got to do that. You've got to do the other. And th this is what absolutely level? massive. And that's that national, that's national yeah, 21. Yeah. So that is a, a national. And again, these studies are, are very, very rare. So, so we've got to try yeah. and... This isn't, uh, it would be interesting to expand these into our own games to see exactly where they are. Uh, what, what's it like for a schoolboy game? What's it like for an 18s age grade national there's, team? There's you a know? good one there that jumps off that page, Brett. 
Yeah. If we all go down the left hand column to enter and talk percentage. Yes. We go we go across and there's one figure that stands out, 22, 22 times it happens to be a woman's coach. Yes. Where they've actually <laughs> Yeah. Is, yep. is that a coincidence or am I just show my bias? So, uh, 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 am, I allowed, am I allowed to make comments like that? I don't think I'm allowed to make comments like that. Um, I, I gotta, I'm going to ignore that for a while. Well, it jumps um, off the page. <laughs> yeah, it does. It definitely does. Um, just in terms of types of communications, gesture, gestures, or, um, gestures, which is um, you flapping your arms around, are actually quite low, which I thought, this is a French okay. study, I thought it would be quite high. Now, the French amateur game, you can see there's a 25 times, or 25% was, was throwing your arms around. However, shout and call. So for the 20s coach, and, and you've got to remember, th these studies are, are snapshot in time. You know, and yeah. it's a snapshot, in, 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 it might only be a, uh, one event. And, and you don't know the, the reasons behind why they did this. So they might have, had a red card and decided to shed abuse of the referee and it was never a red card, whatever it is. And so, so, you, so you've got to be mindful when you look at studies like this. I did think it was interesting that the two women's coaches, basically their percentage of shouting was actually very low, but two yeah. of them were very high. So like you can see there's a six zero percent yeah. and then there's a 73, 78. So like obviously we could be looking at a head coach and an assistant coach and then the other two are just peripherals. Obviously, um, personality, personality plays yeah. a major, major part yeah. in this, Brett. Yeah. Huge, huge role, role in all of this. Um, made to come, which is basically calling a player over and, and, um, and, and speaking to him. Now, I, I see this quite a bit in soccer because soccer have those technical zones around the, around the pitches. So you see the, the Pep Guardiola's calling players over and, and then speaking to him directly. Obviously, if you shout instruction onto the field and you don't want the opposition to hear, that's uh, that's probably why that, that that is, but it's very low for the for the others. And again, that's that's one for you to coaches to to figure out what are is my behaviour like on the sideline? How am I communicating? You know, am I am I sitting on the halfway line? Um, I, I I got a gig after after Scotland uh, coaching the local rugby team where my father in law was 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 involved and played with, and he said, "Will you come out and coach?" And I said, "Okay." I'll, Go on, yeah. I'm doing nothing else. I've been sacked. Uh, I've no job. But so I decided to coach at, at, a, at a, a club site, a small little club site, country club site. And um, after four games, I got I got Shepherd's hook into the into the committee, and uh, they said, um, uh, "Brett, we've something to talk to you about." And I said, "What? what? Because you don't say anything on the sideline when the game's on." Jeez. And I said, "What do you mean?" And they said, "Well, you don't talk. You don't. You're not. You're not saying anything." I said, well, I said, I'm, not, I'm not with you. Like. And he goes, well, you need to shout at the players. You need to, you need to continue to shout. And, and I'm, kind of, I'm kind of going, what? So, so the next game, will you, will you shout at the players? I'm just like going, this is just... Now, we're talking about amateur level, and, and that was obviously what, how they were brought up as players, and they've moved into the committee, and this is what they wanted. But I, 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 this was foreign to me. It really, really was foreign. You know? and, but again... I think we have to have an understanding as coaches what is either acceptable because we're representing a team. Are you looking like horses arse on the sideline? What, what are you doing here? Um, where where or, does, just a quick one, Brett. Yeah. Where does gesture, uh, as in behaviour, yep. you know, does it play a part in what we're doing? Does emotion, showing emotion as a form of communication, is it, is it part of, the coaching environment. Um, yeah, look, I, I'm going to sit in the fence on that one and say it depends. And I tell you why I say that. It depends on the team that you have. It depends on. I, I I like a coach on the sideline that shows shows they care and shows a bit of emotion and shows a bit of, you know, they can say anything as long as yeah. it's not about them. Yeah. If that makes sense. Yeah. As long as it's not about you know, hey, look at me, I'm the head coach. And like, I've coached against coaches who are speaking for the sake of speaking and they're speaking to let the players know that he's in charge and let, let everyone on the sideline know he's in charge. Um, whereas the better coaches are just so more measured and so controlled and they're controlled in the information that they give. They, they, 
they speak actually one of the slides says they actually speak the more successful coaches are the ones that speak 50 percent less than less successful coaches and there is studies like that out there and again it, it would just be interesting to throw it out to the people that are here about what what, what would their view is do they do you actually know yourself that you're doing this how effective are you when you shout instruction onto the players are you seen as being encouragement what what do the players think have you ever asked your players, how did you feel when I shouted that at you? Are we shouting encouragement? Are we going, well done, like Alex Ferguson said, well done, that's really good. Or is that a majority of your messaging? Or is it negative messaging? Don't miss another tackle. If you do that again, I'm taking you off. You know, what, what is it? And then down on these studies, you'll see um, the evolution of um, or evaluation of feedback positive feedback and negative feedback so the french 20s you can see there they're cut 50 50 negative feedback positive fe feedback you know what are you what are you saying have you have you actually stopped and thought about that as a coach what what is your chain of communication here to the players and well, then I mean, take the players take the, the players out of this equation sorry go well, on that's that's the other one too Brady. like um you know if we use context you know are we consciously looking at having a 50-50 split between positive and negative feedback, you know, on any game. I mean, you know, I don't see the significance of a weighting there. I think yeah. that the performance dictates, uh, you know, on the positive, but also it, the, you can be negative. It'd be interesting to see how they define negative. Yes. Like in terms of, is it constructive um, feedback? Uh, and that yep. may be perceived as negative by the player. I don't know. I don't know what their yeah. parameters are on the research, yeah. but yeah. But the point I'm trying to make is that there needs to be a conscious, a conscious, um, from what I'm hearing from you, Brett, there needs to be a conscious effort by the coach to understand the yes. way he's actually being uh, perceived by the playing group, whether yes. it's in, in coach instruction, is it, is it authoritarian, is it yeah. derogatory? You know, you need to assess and review how you actually speak. Um, yep. probably the more informed, depending on whether it's training or game day. Uh, they're all things that need to be thrown in the mix uh, yep. with regards to comms, when you start to define comms. Yeah. So I just saw that study is interesting just to show up and just to, which might get us thinking around, around what our in-game communication is, because we take out the players in all of this. What's your communication like to your physio? Um, to the, the guy who's in charge of your subs. I, I don't know whether people have, have microphones and stuff like that or they're sitting up in the stands and, and it just depends on, on what level that you're at. Um, the, the players themselves, um, the referee, that's another one where, where you, you've got to try and work out what your communication level is in game with the referee. I, 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 I was an analyst for a team uh, that... Uh, the coach, no, the assistant coach went into the players before the game started and said, we've got to manage the referee. And, and he's given it socks uh, about managing the referee. He got sent off after three minutes for abusing the referee, three minutes into the game. And you're kind of going, what type of message was that to the players? By the way, they actually won the game and all the way home on the bus. That's all they talked about, the players. So the players, their victory actually was the last game and they, they won their Interpro series. And, all the players talked about in the way home the bus was the communication skills of the, of the assistant coach, you know, and it was, but I'm not too sure whether the, that coach had much self-awareness of, of the messaging that he was giving the players before yeah. the game. And then his actions co totally contradicted the messaging that he, that he was. I, I, it's just, it's just a good story to share yeah. just to show, show the, the, the different parts of, of this. Um, Freddie, you got um, a couple of questions there. If you want to. Yeah. So the, the question was just, it was back to the study. One of the boys picked up that there was two different coaches on there. There was the first half and the second half and how they're. Okay. So, oh, yeah, yeah, that's it. Yeah. That, that was just the pick yeah. up. So I was just sort of trying to work out, determine the interest. Oh, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Reactive from a first half point of view and maybe when it's the games in line and the second half and how it changes. Yeah. Oh, yeah well, as, as Ando says, obviously game context comes into it. Yeah. You know, uh, how, how you actually approach this and what you're actually saying. Um, looking at when the whistle goes, we're, we're really good at, at, at coaches, a majority of us looking at team performance. So we, we have our, 
we have our, our, our fitness guys looking at, at GPS and we have our physios assessing injuries, how do people go. We do our own measurements of, of what the players do on the field. But what's your performance like as a coach when the, during the 80 minutes? And I, I'm not too sure we really got our head around this in coach education yet. I don't know whether, I don't know whether we've turned the spotlight around, whereas we're, we're pretty good at sitting in the stands. Like trying to, oh, he missed a tackle. He made a tackle. He made a pass. He missed the pass. He made a kick. He didn't make a kick. And we're good at this. But I'm not too sure we really shine the light on ourselves in any of this. And it'd be interesting to know the coaches that are out there is do we analyze our own performance during the game? I put up that, that one of, of Eddie Jones, who obviously is from your neck of the woods. Um, Eddie's done a phenomenal job in every single gig he's done. It's, he's, he is a phenomenal coach. However, some of, the, some of the messages he would put out is, it's all about the players, not about me. Uh, the players have got a problem solve on the field. The players have got to do X, Y, and Z on the field. Well, if that's the case, why do you have a microphone shouting instructions? Why do you have a, a water carrier giving you, giving you if, if you say you, you give trust to the players all the time, I'm not too sure whether this is the same messaging, if, if that makes sense. Now, I understand the coach has got to have it for, for injury substitutions and, and all that kind of stuff. But um, it's just interesting. Are we, are we coaches that are trying to PlayStation the players? Actually, I, I did see a really good clip about a, a PlayStation coach, which I, I couldn't find then to put it in. On. I just wanted to show you. Um, but, but what type of coach are you when this game is going on? How much do you intervene as a coach? How much information do you give? Can your players take on that information if you are communicating with your players? Have the ability to, to make tactical shifts within your game? So if you've decided, um, I, I'll give you an example. We, we were playing top of the league game uh, in just after Christmas, just before all of this shutdown happened. And we were winning the game by, by 15, 20 points. And we decided that the opposition were going to run the ball. So we were able to turn around and say, well, let's change our defense and we'll play 14 across the front line and we play one in the backfield. So the message for me was to the fullback, let's change to 14-1. And they could change straight away and they changed to 14-1. So they were sitting there with 13-2 and they changed. So they had the ability to do it. If I take myself back 12 months, I couldn't do that with a school side I worked with because they didn't have the knowledge and I didn't impart them with the knowledge and give them the knowledge. They, they would have had an inability. So if I had said the same message to them, I would have got something else. What, what's he talking about? I don't understand this. So because the capability of your players, I'm dealing with semi-professional, professional players, they, they understand the game a lot better. So the information I would give is at a certain level Whereas it might not be the certain level when I'm dealing with 17 year olds. So I think we've got to understand the level of players that we're dealing with when it comes to messaging and communication. Um, how do we communicate? Are we communicating like Eddie is slapping the table? Are we roaring? Are we shouting? Are we gesturing? Are we, are we showing up fingers? What are we doing here? You know, because the, the sideline becomes in a very animated place at times. And again, do you analyze your own performance? Um, Overcoaching and competition. Um, I, I find this topic really, really interesting. And there is a bit of studies around it. Uh, I have a quote there from Popoff Popovich, who's a basketball coach in America. He's won the uh, basketball is now, I don't know whether in Australia, it's a, uh, Last Dance is pretty popular, yeah. is it? Yep. Yeah. It's, so um, basketball is now massive in Ireland. So the amount of kids now that are on the, on the, on the street there just playing basketball I can see two at the moment but I've learned to shut up more sometimes being quiet and letting the players play is much more important than trying to be Mr. Coach and teach him this and teach him that I just really love that quote because we've got to let them play they, they don't need a big daddy over them all the time you know and if you if your training can reflect moments of the game you don't have to intervene as much. You don't have to start overcoaching. Because um, the research is telling us, research shows that top coaches give 50% fewer comments to their athletes during competition. And 
if I actually think back to the to the more successful coaches, yeah, they are the quiet ones. I really like last that, the last dance when, when I'm looking at, at Phil Jackson. He, he's very controlled. Now I know the snapshot is more of the players and more of Michael Jordan, but but the, I think it's episode three is is more about the coach. He's very controlled. I, I don't see much ranting and raving on the sideline. When it goes into those timeouts, his messaging is very very clear. You know those those timeouts with five seconds left on the clock, and obviously he's got the best basketball players in the world of, of a generation that he, he can play these plays, but his messaging is extremely clear. And any, again, I don't know whether you, your experience is, Ando, you've worked with, with some very successful head coaches too, and whether, whether you get that same vibe from them. Uh, yeah, it varies, mate. Um, and a lot of it depends on, and, and I mentioned it before around personality. I mean, one yeah. thing you can't contrive behaviorally is you, you, you can't restrict your personality. The animation, yep. I'm always interested in the animation of a coach at half time or providing messages. You mentioned, you know, in a basketball match, I mean, you know, five on five, you know, they have stoppages. It lends itself to, you know, being a little bit animated, you know, a little bit of hype. Uh, it's all part of the theatre, uh, as distinct from a rugby environment where, you know, you get messages run on through the field, but your, your opportunity on game day, you know, is that, you know, 10 to 12 minutes at half time. Um, so, you know, like, I, I'm always one of those guys, I've been lucky, I suppose, in some respects, I've, I've largely been at a pro level. So your training week becomes essentially your platform. So yeah. to me, I've always been of the uh, philosophy, if you're coaching on game day, you haven't done your work. Yep. So to me, to me, game day is about the player and the group. Um, you might, as a coaching staff, you might provide um, a little bit of subtlety uh, around a halftime commentary, um, but largely that should be led by the senior player group. Um, you might do some work with the, the individuals. You might chat to individuals on their own. Um, so... You know, I think each environment has its own its own uniqueness, Brett, too, like with the yep. way the coach interacts. And also what I do believe in, though, is the less less is better. Uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's like that, that bit of research there at the bottom. Um, that might be the reason. The reason why they don't talk as much is because they've actually got the work done. You know, they've prepared their players all day to, 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 the, to the problems that they're having or the success that they're having. They've prepared them to such a such a high level that they don't need to talk. Well, you they mentioned a, key, a very key area there, Brett, which is a topical subject, as Dill will attest to, um, you know, around problem solving. You know, um, put the whistle away, so to speak, stop over coaching, um, allow the group um, to decision make and come up with solutions instead of us just handing it yep. to the players on a plate. Yep. Um, so we, we've, we've been working on this for a couple of years, I suppose, in our, in our academy and pathway programs, but, um, you know, with our coaches. Um, I mean, it's a big area. It's a massive area, and it's one we're still learning. Yeah, I, I think it, we definitely have those, those sort of issues in the Northern Hemisphere. We, we, we are obviously, the majority of our players come through a very structured schools program where it's, it's teacher-led, and it, uh, the teacher is stands in front of a classroom and bellows out instruction and, and that's what they do on the training field. You know, they're, 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 they're definitely not encouraged to explore. Now the, now the better ones, the better schools coaches do. Um, there's, some, there's some really good schools coaches in Ireland. The majority of our, our top coaches are from schools background or teaching backgrounds. So They've got they a fair few that. online at the moment, so be careful. <laughs> okay. Um, one of the key ones as well when you do intervene will it make a difference and have you actually stopped after 80 minutes and said well I, I, I used 10 messages there which one of them made a difference did they all or did any you know and there's times where I've, I've started instructions onto a player and they're like yeah okay and you kind of gone well what are we doing? So, so there's a, there's a one we had about two seasons back where we said, right, 
at half time we said well we're going to limit the number of phases inside our own half so we're just going to take it through uh, one phase we have a win behind us exit restart comes in the second half they go through 17 phases and score in the quarter 100 meter try and you're just going right okay that's that kind of blend that that covers me as a coach you know and, and we we've all had those moments you know and so when you when you do intervene does it make a difference um i want to show you something here um which i'm just gonna uh which is just tactical information i, I i'm going to take this clip from ireland versus england and yeah we watch some rugby which i know people people want to watch they don't want to listen to me um and i want you to watch ireland are playing a 13-2 defense so there's two defenders which they put down the the, the 15s okay and england have um they've decided they're going to go after this so they go 9-10 they put a high ball up and um, they draw the fullback into it okay so they get him in the rook so now there is nothing in the backfield this is the big five so the second row knew knew was the plan now it's obviously fallen to the wrong person and he's decided to kick one through and it hasn't come off okay so that was the first attack of the game. This is the second attack of the game. I'm gonna just there's no sound, so you just play it through. Okay. I would have thought that the that it would have been seen that they worked out what those English tactics were, where they were going and what they were trying to do. Yeah. But Nothing has changed. The picture hasn't changed. Okay. Now England decide they're going to go into the channel again and they, they turn the ball over. Okay. So we'll just move on to the next clip. Comes to here. Okay. So it's a bit, it's a bit unstructured. So this is now 20 minutes into the game of Ireland painting the same picture defensively. England have tried a number of kicks. Okay, so it puts them under a bit of pressure and that's what happens. You as a coach, do you recognize what the opposition are trying to do? And do you band-aid to try and fix, to disrupt their tactics? Or, or do you have the ability to do this? Are your players aware that this has happened? Because I'm looking at these clips, and by the way, there's seven or eight of them I could show um, of the exact same thing. and. I'm kind of going, well, if the players haven't problem solved it, is that now our time to intervene as a coach? Yes. Because they haven't, they, they had an inability to spot this, but, but this doesn't get fixed because that's about 20 minutes in. Okay. And then this happens on about 34 minutes. Okay, so my question is to, to you as a coach, at what stage do you jump into this and intervene and, and problem solve this? Because that to me was a coachable moment. Yeah, it is. Um, yeah, I agree, Brad. It's, it's, system, it's systems versus um, recognition by player or problem solving by player. The intervention should have occurred probably after, I, I think about, what that third clip was about what, yeah. 20 minutes in. Yeah. Surely, surely we, yeah. we'd recognise as a coaching group that that wasn't happening. It wasn't changing up the defensive structure. There should have been messages in between there. Yeah. Um, now, obviously, we're, we're not privy to there, there could have been a messaging gone, system gone in and the players chose to ignore it. Still there ignoring. might not have been any. Like we don't, we don't, we're not privy to that sort of information on, on game day. And it's very easy for us to sit here and, and make comments on, on, on a coaching staff when, when realistically it might not have been their issue. They might have tried to problem solve it. But the reason why I put up the clips is as a coach, are you recognizing what the opposition are doing, how they're actually going about it? And do you have a communication method to yes. actually fix these? Because if the players clearly in those clips, they've failed to, um, to survive in the environment, 
and to, to problem solve that on the fly, maybe we do have to intervene. And maybe those, those 50%, there is a time where you have to actually speak. You know, right. And I think that's, they're, they're huge coachable moments. Ireland lost that test by 10 or 12 points. You know, it's 14 there, I just showed you. Yeah. You know, and I think it's, uh, I think after the first attack, they should have gone, oh, hold on a minute. What are we doing? Now, is the coach good enough to, to recognise this as well? You'd hope even post-match uh, debrief, they'd be questioning their methodology there, Brett. Yes. Yeah. And, and it's, definitely, it's definitely a learning uh, for coaches, that. Yeah. It's definitely a learning for players. And hopefully they'll evolve that if this happens again, that they can problem solve in that area you know, as, as, as they move along. Um, the communication process is an interesting one. So I, I, I've just taken this from, 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 a, from a bit of research by Kiaut and, and Rod, um, Rodwell. So basically, you have the message, so, so the sender. So that's going to be the head coach. He's got a few things he's got to think about. So we can communicate through words. We can communicate through body language. And we communicate through voice, through tone and speed. So for me, is it actually, does your message have clarity? Is it clear? Um, and whether it be verbal or body language or voice, is the message that's in your brain coming out of your mouth or coming out of your hands uh, understandable? Because it has to go somewhere. So use of player's name, I like. Um, again, I, I've seen coaches do this, and the, and the more successful coaches in their coach behavior are ones that use players' names because it's very clear. You shout onto a field on the sideline, we, we need to do X, Y, and Z why don't you just use the player's name of who you're actually talking to? And it might be a captain, it might be a, a tactical decision making or whatever, you're nine, um, anyone who's in charge of that area. I think the message should be short and repeated. Okay? Short and repeated. Um, gain acknowledgement, so you want to have something back that they actually understand, whether it be a nod, thumbs up, um, any sort of gesture back, and not a yes or a no. And that's just for you to understand that the message has been received. However, once the message is sent, there's a few little issues that have got to come. So was it encoded? So was it heard? Okay. Did, they, did the person get that message? Did they decode what that message was? And what did they decode that message as? Because it must go to a message receiver. Because with that, there is a load of noise. And there's a lot of noise and it's not so much um, noise levels or people shouting or anything. It's the message. It's the noise around the message. You know, did you, did you say who that message was for? Or did you say when this was going to happen? Because what you said might be not what they heard if your message isn't clear enough. And then it goes to a receiver. For us during game day, we look for feedback from the receiver. However, there is a second receiver. And the second receiver might be the messenger who you're giving the message to. It might be the physio who's giving a message back. It might be uh, the, the substitution that you've made on the sideline. It has to go to the referee or, or to the fourth official, depending on what level that we're working with. But you can see where the muddy waters start to come and you can see all the processes that a message has to go through. So the simpler you can make your message, the easier for it to be understood by the receiver or the second receiver. Because from receiver one to receiver two, that whole process has to start again. And there's countless numbers. Like I could, I could bore you with, actually go into a bookstore and go and sit on one of those self-help um, um, sections of a bookstore and you'll find thousands of books on this. Absolute thousands of uh, American uh, popular psychology sort of books around it. But it's a very simple process as long as the beginning of the process is made simple. Does that make sense, Ando? Um, it, it does. And it's um, the problem we've got, obviously, with messaging and it's the interpretation. Yeah. The, de the, the coding is obviously critical. And the other yeah. part of it is, particularly on match day, Brett, like, uh, I, you know, the queuing, the language we use in session yeah. has to has to have a succinct understanding with each player for each movement or moment um, that occurs in conflict in a game so that the guys can actually decode and problem solve themselves 
if yeah. they can't, as we discussed before, the cueing that we provide as a coaching group, if it's not helping, if the players aren't decoding or problem solving, it's the cueing that you've learnt, which is the summary of your work, the cues yep. that you use in training that becomes pertinent and, and prevalent inside the game. Uh, but you can see all the different junctures there where it can actually fail, which yep. is one of our biggest problems, obviously. Uh, and again, for the message to start, as a coach, you've got to figure out what is the message. So there's a whole other jigsaw puzzle going on here. Like, sure. how, how do I get that information? Who's this information for? When can I send this? Like, I, 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 it's, it's learning for me. I, I, I've seen coaches on the sideline. I, I'm guilty of it too, by the way, where the scrum half's putting the ball in and all of a sudden someone shouts out, play Mars bar ball, play yeah. 45 ball, whatever. And you're calling out the play and you're kind of going, well, hold on a minute. That involves repositioning of the players and they can't do it that, that close. And it's, it's like a blind panic. But I'm kind of looking at the person that sent the message. What did he, what did he think he was going to achieve there by that? Because the That's noise right. around that is actually the movement of the game. You know, so yes. so being, when you're actually putting on the message, that's why the, the messaging during an injury is, is you might be able to get it. Like that might be your moment to get that information in. Yeah, you, you got to pick, you pick critical moments that are conducive, you know, to deciphering the message, Brett. Like it's, yep. and it's not that hard to recognize those parts um, yep. in the game, but certainly yelling out from the sideline while the play's in movement. I mean, that's just a, that's, that's a joke. Uh, but we hear it. Uh, yep. Line out calls. Yeah, line out calls, yeah. Yeah, good, eh? We'll change that up on, well, let's run the ball in. <laughs> but hello. <laughs> Yeah, uh, or even, even stuff like even shouting, play a six man and they're sitting there with five and then one player who hears this, he runs from where he's been and he runs all the way across. Meanwhile, meanwhile the out half has called a certain play, which is the five man play. I, look, I, I have to write a book on this uh, in terms of what I've seen and um, we probably have all, we've all made these mistakes as well, by the way. Yeah. Um, so, Bre so Brady, um, I don't want to push you too hard. We're on that hour and a half mark. Yeah, um, I tell you what. Could you just summarize, wanna... yeah, the next five minutes so to, so we can get some interaction. If there's anyone out there for questions. Yeah, um, I want to look at half time, um, and I, I I had this um, I had this exercise done on myself, and this was a uh, light bulb moment for me and my coaching. Um, where the the camera went on me, I was microphoned. Uh, camera went on me for uh, the pre match, so was able to see my uh, my interactions with the referee, interactions with the players, interaction with the staff, interactions of 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 taking player or taking the team through the warm up. And um, then the camera stayed on me at the side of the pitch to to see the interactions between the coaches. Now, I'm the only one mic'd up here. Um, the other coaches aren't. And, and then at half time, and I want to show you the half time one. This exercise was definitely a light bulb moment for me and my coaching because I didn't know I did some of the things that I did. And it, uh, it highlighted things that I was good at, but it also highlighted things I needed to get better at. And I'm just going to show you the first interaction. And this is. Um, this is a segment of halfway where they've split forwards and backs, which is a pretty common one. This is the Leinster under 18 team. It's a tournament, last game in the tournament. Uh, the context around it is that the opposition have just scored two tries right on half time. Okay, so there is a bit of panic about the team at that stage. We, it was 14 7 half time. So we conceded the 14 points around that last three minutes of the half. So this is me talking to the backs. Well, what's working? What do we what do we need to work on to win this next half? Yeah, we have to cross the game line. Just we're getting caught. We're getting caught in where we're going, oh I'm gonna add a pass, I'm gonna add a pass, instead of actually just stepping and squaring through contact. Like this is not a day for fancy fancy backline players. Like, this is cross the game line and give the forward something for us for them to target. What have you got in your locker that can that can open them up? 
Yeah, screenplay. You don't have to complex this at all. Okay, let's be really direct. Let's try and open them up around that 12, 13 channel. Okay, there is a hole, but there's a separation between their 12 and 13. Okay, once we get that on the chases, just cool the jets. You don't have to go up and start throwing your throwing your arms into it. Cool the jets on on the on the on that, those plays. No forcing passes. We're fine. That's a huge win, lads. I'm not bothered. I'm not bothered with that scoreline. Okay. Just notice in the last few minutes of our half, when we got to about 15, yeah. the swinger came right up. There was so much yeah, space. Okay. There, was a lot of there is a, a lot of those channel kicks down that yeah. side on that left side were pretty pretty effective. So we're going to have to look at that. Okay, so keep an eye on that. Just you know, got to reload that line a bit earlier, that short side line. Rewind, really, really, it's on. Okay, so so that's the that's the interaction between the backs and and the coach. Um, Ando, any anything on that feedback? What? what? Um, I, they're a little bit slow to to engage. Yeah. Um, maybe it's because you started with, you know, potentially a, a question around the performance, which they were struggling with. I don't know. Do you have a senior guy in that group that? A captain or a vice captain or yeah the captain is actually in the forwards group so so we have a there's a vice captain who's the 10 i think no sorry he's actually 13. so uh, you know a normal for me it would have been a chat with the 10 before we got into the huddle yeah and then it would have been potentially asking the 10 to summarize uh the half and see if we could you know just for two minutes to yeah. see where you could actually segue in so yeah. You led. You led from the front. Yeah. Um, look, there's horses and courses, but there's particular systems and different methods that I'd use. I'd need to know the psychology of the group as well, the dynamic yeah. in the group. But generally, yeah. I'd go to a, a, a ten. In this case, I'd chat to him first. I'd probably potentially ask him uh, to problem solve first and look at the solution. What is the potential solution? You did challenge him on that. Yep. Yeah. Uh, you did um, ask. Um, what do you what do you think of the questions that were posed to the players? Uh, I think you were leading them to potential solution yeah rather than rather than it coming from the group. I think it took them a little while, uh, Brett, before they got into the motion of this is us. we can actually we know what's going on. We know what's yeah. happening out there. Um, but you know, uh, again, it's you know the group. Yeah, I, I thought it was interesting, but the light bulb moment for me isn't actually that halftime talk. The light bulb moment for me is actually this one because this was the whole group. So I coach the defence on this team, okay, and we've obviously just um, conceded fourteen points. I take it personally <laughs> because I'm the defence. I'm in charge of the defence, but I just want to hear this interaction which is actually happens before this one. Um, for me, just two things. Defensively, we're in a pretty good shape most of the time. What's happening is it's when we break away from the system that's causing us a bit of problems. So let's not break away from it. I don't need the third man to go in and start counter-rooking and smashing in Lee. We've done that two, on two or three times. On the kicks, lads, it's, it's blue wall. It's blue wall. What's happening is we're going up on ones and twos and they're just picking us off all the time on offloads. Get a blue wall. If you can't get one, just slow the whole thing right down and wait for your partner to come. And well, that was all uh, you. Yeah, it is all me. <laughs> and it was... By the way, there's... It's only, it's only when you actually see yourself yeah. and your behaviour and your communication skills do you actually realise that it was all about me. Because... Yeah. If I walked off that field, uh, we, we actually we won, the, won the game in the end, but if I walk off that field into the change room and we've had a nice win and we got ourselves a nice trophy and, uh, and everything's great, there's no, learning for the, there's no learning around what happened here yeah. for me. But because, of the, because I now have the video and because I've had this exercise done to me, and I, I've had it done a few times now, just, to, just an area that I wanted to get better at so that I felt I wasn't good enough at. So this is my first. This was the first attempt at it. Are, but, you, are your players mature enough, Brett? Like we've got same uh, same age players. Like last year, as an example, with our academy, we had the the players assess the coaches. Yeah. Are they at Are they at that level? 
Oh, I think there's there's probably a good chunk of them of these particular players that can can do that if, and will do if that. They're mature enough and capable enough. Yeah. Nothing better than have a three sixty. Yes. Your players. Yeah, I would I would totally agree with that. Like we're looking at those players. There's probably six players in that group that will play professional rugby within the next twelve months. Yeah. And there's I'm I'm just looking. There's there's two current Irish under twenties players in that in that group. So there's they're they're good players. They they their rugby intellect is actually very high. They've come from fantastic schools, um, a school system where they've they've worked with some really really good coaches. So yeah, you could definitely do that sort of exercise. But look, the point I'm trying to make is that for you to evolve as a coach, you need to actually get in and have, have you've got to scratch the surface and you've got to yeah. you've got to shine the light in, in in that's something that you might be uncomfortable with. You know, and yeah. I, I've watched this whole 70 minutes and the interaction between the coaches, the physio, making substitutions, referees. What was my reaction when we conceded that second try? Uh, how, much, uh, how much information was I, was I given onto the field? And I learned more about my coaching by doing an exercise like this. And I, I yeah. would strongly, strongly recommend you as a coach to look at yourself I know we video ourselves in terms of our, our accreditations for coaching courses and stuff, and we, we might video ourselves on the training pitch, but there's no better um, education than putting you in that live situation where the pressure's on. Like we're yeah. representing our province there. We've got the most talented kids at 17 years of age in the, on the island. And I just think I would strongly recommend that, that you do that as a coach. You know, so there's, there's a bit of learning on it. Definitely, Brett. It's a very, very good point. Look, we might put a full stop on that part of it, Brett, and we've got a yeah. couple of questions here coming through on the chat line. Uh, Dill? Yep, so I'll just bring in Ross Tommy. Ross Tommy, mate, you want to hop in? Yeah, thanks, Dill. Thanks, Brett, for tonight. It's been really good. Yep. Um, on that side of, side of communications, I just wondered how it went. Um, how does it go with the players when you've got it wrong or not quite right as a coach, particularly as you were just talking about with giving yourself feedback and analysing yourself and whether it's in hindsight for like selecting a player or tactically and that kind of thing and keeping the respect within the player and vice versa. Obviously, you've got to be open and honest with yourself. But how, yeah. how does that go? Has that, have you had that in your experience and what sort of come of it, basically? Yeah, just in terms of that feedback, in terms of the, that, uh, that video, players wouldn't have any knowledge. They, they know that you're mic'd up and they know you're part of a of a coach education program and that's why you're doing it and we have explained to the players but in terms of us making mistakes as coaches I'm probably nearly too honest for my own good I would definitely tell a player if he's if I've dropped a player or moved a player on or, or not selected the player and they're in like we have a squad of 26 there um, if we've made a mistake we're the first ones to actually say it we do actually an interesting one with that particular group where we had to select a squad of 26 before our last game for a tournament. We picked the 26 and one of the players who wasn't selected went out and we played Northampton, which are a big English academy. And we went and beat them. Um, and he played and he was man of the match and scored two tries. And my only thing I could say to him, because of the nature of the competition, you had to register players and all this for a tournament. I had to have a conversation which made me look like a horse's arse. But I think I'm honest enough and mature enough to say, listen, you played really well. I'm delighted the way you play. And I said, I think I've made a mistake in selection. Now, I don't know how many coaches actually can do that, but I had the conversation with that particular player and it was really uncomfortable because I did make a mistake. And then in the tournament itself, player never appeared in any of the tournaments. That kept going on in my mind. But I think I only have that true experience. I would never have said that 10 years ago. Not a chance. But I think your maturity as a coach and because you've been in those situations definitely help you evolve and, uh, for, for situations like that. We're not perfect. I tell all my players I will make absolutely more mistakes than you. And, and, I, and I do that repeatedly. And, and it, it becomes a bit more human and they see you as a human. They don't see you as super coach, solve all the problems, know it all. I def, I've, I've no problem telling the players or telling any environment that I'm in that I will make mistakes. I don't prepare teams, and none of us do here, to lose rugby matches. And I know I've said it early on in, the, in, in it, in, in this presentation. And I think when the players see that human side of you, 
and that vulnerability that you have, I think they have more respect for you for, for doing that, for, for showing that. But we, we make tons of mistakes. Absolutely. No different than I say telling the players to play one phase exit and they score a 19 phase 100 meter try. Like, we, we make tons of mistakes. Every, we make selection mistakes, bench mistakes, bringing people on at the wrong time. But, but that's part of our learning. That's, we're not going to get it right. I'm sure um, the, the Eddie Joneses and the, the Stuart Lancasters and all these coaches at the high end, they make tons, tons and tons of mistakes. I showed a picture of Ireland. They have fantastic coaching staff. Andy Farrell is a very well-experienced ex- player, coach. He's coached at every single level. That's a mistake. Now, I'd like to think that he learned from that mistake, but I, I think we're only human. Like we're, we're going to do that. It's like driving a car. Right, thank you. Thanks, Ross. Um, perhaps I'll just bring you in now. You're off mute now. I'm off mute. <laughs> there you are. There you are, perhaps. I oh, know, it's terrible. Um, firstly, Brett, thank you so much for imparting no all of your experience. Thanks. Um, my question's around, as a coach, with the game being, say, 90% unstructured with multi phase, yeah. um, that 10% being set piece, how much do yeah. you concentrate on allowing your players to independently problem solve within scenario based unstructured play as opposed to giving them prescription structured play, unstructured play? Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, no, it makes sense. Uh, we're, it depends on the level that you were at. And this is, this is the way I've done it. And it's not to say that this way is the right way. Uh, we would have a, a backs WhatsApp group and I'd put up maybe the defense of the opposition of set play and they run that. But I'm running a back line where all seven players are, are capped under 20s internationals. They're uh, in the Leinster Academy. They've played for their senior province. They, they've got, some of them have 10, 12 caps. We, we one of our backs played against Argentina in a test match. So I can do that and I can release the handbrake for that particular group because I know their knowledge is, is far greater than mine and they know what will work and what won't work. And nine times out of 10, they'll pull a play from, that they've got from Stuart Lancaster or Felipe Contiponi or someone and they'll pull a Leinster play and they'll put the name to it. But I'll try and mirror that in training on a Thursday, the defensive situation. They will play their play and then I might interact and say, well, I'm not too sure whether that, have we tried the shorter pass, have we tried short, shorter line or go a bit wider? So we'll have that conversation. But that's a really, I've built a really strong relationship with them, with those players, and I've allowed yeah. them to do that. However, the 18s, we don't have that luxury. And I'm and probably more tell because of the experience that they have. I feel as though I have a wealth of experience and I've been put into that position to open up with my experience you know where we can sit there so we have this old sabutio and oh you know sabutio do you yeah yeah the old football game we actually have the sabutio men and we try and do an education with them off the field um where we will give them different scenarios and we'll ask them what works but it is probably more tell from my my part than not i did an exercise with that with that particular group that you just saw where I said, I want you to, we were playing Munster in a game. I want you to design their backline plays. And I said, I'll be back in a minute. I actually came back. I went upstairs to the glass. I wanted to see what their interaction was like. I left them for half an hour. They actually came up with nothing, nothing at all. And that's when you know that you actually need to help them. So I think it depends on the experience of your players. I know talking to the forwards coach with the lineouts, the forwards will design their own lineouts. So whatever the dynamic of the particular group, and remember that's a transient team, so they, they change each year. But I've tried all these little kind of quirky exercises to see the knowledge of the group. And when the knowledge is low, you have to step in. Otherwise, like you're there to help them. You're there to guide them. You're there to, like you've got the experience, whether it be as a player or as a coach. And, and look, that's sure. just, that's how I do it. But I'm not saying that's the right way, by the way. As a question to that, so how, how much how much input do you give around a you know a, 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 the influence of how the scenario will play out 
Say, for instance, if you're, say, defensively, yep. if you give them four scenarios, yep. is that too much or is it too not enough? I, or do you just... I, I, think that's, I think that's too much. But, um, and it's only too much because we have the group for such a small amount of time. So I try and strip it, strip it down. So, for example, we might say restarts and we might say, well, we're going to go with these two restarts and we'll practice those two restarts. But we're not going to go with five restarts because time constraints doesn't allow us. Now, who picks the two restarts? I, probably, I pick them and I say, this is where we're going. Whereas if I went onto the field and said, right, you're going to receive a restart here, get yourselves into position. You're going to, because we are coming from, say, 13 schools, 14 schools, they'll get into the position they are in their, in their school. So you've actually got to, if you allow them run it, you're going to get the 14 opinions and the whole process just takes longer and longer and longer. Whereas if we say, well, this is what we're going to do, guys, what do you think? And you can have a bit of a discussion. Now, 99% of the time, they'll just nod and they'll just go, yeah, fine. Whereas when I'm coaching UCD, it's, it's different. I, I can, you can have that conversation. They can say, well, oh, Brett, I think we should go with four single jumpers across the field and we'll do this. And you go, okay, grand, let's do it. Get yourselves, get yourselves into the positions. You know, whereas I find with schools, you have to tell a bit more. Um, and look, that's just my experience. Uh, again, it depends on the experience of, of the group that you have. How much work, um, Brett, would you do on, say, uh, transition or turnover ball inside yeah, a, training, we, a training week? A, a massive amount. We've completely, yeah, we've completely changed to that sort of training, that, yeah. that unstructured. Um, like, that's what the game is. We spend a hell of a lot of time on two ball games, um, just throwing the in the answer. other ball. Yeah. That's, the that's the answer Pat was looking for, I think. That's what I was looking for. I want to see how you react to turnover yeah. in Z. Yeah. yeah, no, we, we would spend a hell of a lot of, of, of time on it. I, um, I, did a, I did a talk on tactical periodization on Thursday. Dylan, you were on it. We showed, we showed clips of our training sessions. We start with a box kick. We start with a kick. We start with a turnover. And then we might just start with phase play but a majority of our time is now at Leinster and UCD is spent unstructured uh, we don't have a whole lot of set backline plays or set those set positions but, and we don't spend a whole lot of time on it either and we might do you still have to do the, the midfield scrum but and all that kind of stuff but it's not a whole lot of time on it. No. cool thanks for that Brett appreciate it all right, that's all our questions come through, Ando and, and Brett. So um, anyone that wants to come in for a last one, if not, otherwise, Brett, would you be comfortable with it, uh, the slides going out as well, if anyone that... Yeah, no problem, yeah. No problem at all. Awesome. All righty. Ando, do you want to finish up, mate? No, I do. Oh, it's, look, yeah, obviously, just to say thanks very much, Brett. Um, uh, obviously, um, you've spent a lot of time in preparation. We spent a couple of hours last week um, yep. putting this together um i know your time's precious mate so thanks again and mate your experiences um obviously come out in your presentation it was very good mate uh well okay. done and thanks mate i'm sure, sure you're going to get a fair bit of feedback on the um we all this goes on our platform our web platform yep. so it'll be viewed a lot of people are viewing our work post uh okay, yep. session so we'll keep you informed well, I, well, I need my solicitor to look at that before that goes out. No, I didn't say anything. No, I didn't say no. anything too bad, did I? No, you were, you were quite guarded, I thought. I was trying to drag, <laughs> a, trying to drag a bit out of you about Scott. Yeah, my, you my, my solicitor is standing beside me just telling me what I can say and what I can't say. <laughs> All right, mate. Look, we'll let you go and um, we'll be in touch. Once yeah. again, thanks very much, mate. Much oh, appreciated. thanks, guys. I, I love the stuff that you're doing. It's, um, it's great to have that. Look, it's not great that we're all stuck in this situation, but I think rugby blokes have, uh, have spent it well. I think we've, we've shared. I, I love jumping on to, to people around the world and just listen to them. I've, I've been on some absolute fantastic ones in the last while. And you now keep, keep it going, lads. Well done. Thanks, Brady. We'll chat soon. Regards to Claire and the kids. We'll do. We'll chat soon, mate. Okay. Awesome. Thanks, guys. Thanks Bye, a lot, mate. Brett. See you. Thanks, ya. Brett. Bye. Is Tony staying online? Uh, is he still there? He is. Yeah. Tony?